Welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming today uh, to this talk uh, entitled Moving Toward Mutuality? Question uh, mark by Dr. Phil Cunningham. Uh, my name is Matthew Tapey. I'm the director of the Center for Catholic Jewish Studies and also an assistant professor of theology here at St. Leo University. Uh, today it's very good to see so many friends uh, in the faculty uh, and staff here. Um, Thank you for attending. Uh, I want to recognize a few people and say hello. Um, first to Rabbi Jim Rudin. Rabbi Jim Rudin, would you mind standing for a moment? The recognizing Rabbi Jim Rudin. Uh, for those of you who may not know, Rabbi Jim Rudin is one of the giants in the United States who helped implement the changes in Catholic Jewish relations after the Second Vatican Council. And so it's an honor for us to have him with us today. And he is also co-founder of the Center for Catholic Jewish Studies. He's the reason why we have a center. So it's a real honor. Thank you, Jim, for coming all the way up and from Marsha. Uh, I also want to recognize a former uh, director of the center, Dr. Michael Novak, is here today as well. Thank you for coming, Michael. Um, you can, yeah. And a number of faculty from the uh, Department of Philosophy, Theology, and Religion, including uh, Dr. Woodard, Dr. Oki are here as well, Father Cooper, um, and, and other friends as well. So thank you very much, and my own students, I see some of my students here. Um, without further ado, I want to introduce you to our very special guest, who not only is a speaker here today, but is also a director of an institute for Catholic Jewish relations. Uh, much like the center we have here at St. Leo, so he does similar work, only he does it up in Philadelphia. Um, and uh, Dr. Cunningham, I should also add, is the recipient of the 14th Eternal Light Award, the 14th Eternal Light Award, which is an award that's given to those who make outstanding contributions to Catholic Jewish relations. He'll be given that award tonight in Tampa. If you please uh, join me in congratulating <laughs> Dr. Cunningham is professor of theology, specializing in Catholic Jewish relations. As I said earlier, he's the director of the Institute for Jewish Catholic Relations of St. Joseph's University in Philadelphia. He has served as president of the International Council on Christians and Jews on the advisory committee on Catholic Jewish relations for the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. He's interested in biblical studies and religious education. He has numerous uh, works out, uh, peer-reviewed journal articles and books. Uh, we use Dr. Cunningham's book in our undergraduate course on world religion. Some of you will recognize him as author of the uh, Outsider chapter on Judaism. Uh, Dr. Cunningham's book was also used this past spring in the History and Theology of Catholic Jewish Relations course, the graduate course that I teach here uh, at St. Leo. So it's a real honor to have him. Please uh, give him a warm welcome. Uh, 
is found in a statement that they issued uh, subsequent to their meeting, which said, quote, anti-Semitism has lost none of its force, but threatens to extend to other regions uh, to poison the minds of Christians and to involve humanity more and more in a grave guilt with disastrous consequences. In retrospect, now, many decades later, it's clear that the document this conference issued in 1947 called An Address to the Churches marked a landmark moment in the birth and the gestation, really, of a new relationship between Christians and Jews. Even though their text did not explicitly call for dialogue between the two peoples, the fact that there was a roughly equal number of Jewish and Christian participants in this conference prefigured the interchanges that have happened since uh, with increasing uh, frequency. Their statement inspired numerous other Christian pronouncements, especially, as I already mentioned, in the Catholic community at the Second Vatican Council when it issued its declaration, Nostra Aetate, in our time. Reversing centuries of teachings to the contrary, Nostra Aetate declared, quote, this sacred synod council wants to foster and recommend that mutual understanding and respect which is the fruit, above all, of biblical and theological studies as well as of fraternal dialogues, end quote. The institute that I now co-direct with a Jewish colleague was founded in 1967 in direct response to this 1965 conciliar call for quote-unquote fraternal dialogues. However, in those decades, immediately after the Second Vatican Council and after the Second World War, it was not at all clear that Jews and Christians could engage in respectful conversation. A thousand years, a thousand years of intergroup contempt combined with the recent Nazi genocide made the likelihood of dialogue seem very remote. As one Jewish observer said, quote, all we want of Christians is that they keep their hands off us and our children, end quote. Influential voices in both communities expressed alarm at the prospect of open dialogue, saying that it would surely endanger the religious identities of both communities. The Jewish and Christian relationship that came to birth from these uncertain beginnings might be compared to a newborn human being. Just as major milestones in early childhood development are learning how to talk and how to walk, a primary task for those pioneering dialogists was to learn how to speak to one another. Although human babies are genetically hardwired toward language acquisition, pioneering Jewish Christian dialogue folks were challenged by centuries of hostility, suspicion, fear, stereotyping, and oppositional thinking. How were Jews and Christians ever to really communicate with one another? Now, at the risk of pushing my childhood metaphor a little too far, if, generally speaking, Jews and Christians have been interacting for about 2,000 years, then the few decades since the Shoah, since the Holocaust, amount to only one fortieth of that entire history. If the human lifespan in the Western world is rounded off to about 80 years of age, then the new relationship between Christians and Jews after the Second World War is even today, in 2018, still only equivalently at the point of toddlerhood. We're just beginning. What I'd like to do is to sketch out quickly, as you'll see from the outline you have in your handout, is what lessons I think have been learned by Jews and Christians participating, and I want to stress this, in a dialogue, in an interchange, and in conversation that is historically unprecedented. These are new, unheard of conversations that happen in our time. 
The dialogue as it's unfolded in the last 70 years has developed in different ways in different parts of the world. There's a lot of work that remains to be done. The new relationship has yet to graduate to preschool, uh, let alone to higher educational trajectories. But no one can doubt, as I've said, that we've seen a historic revolution. So what have we learned? First, we learned that we needed time and commitment to build trust. Past behavior had taught Jews and Christians, uh, quote, that Christians' only interest is to cause all the Jews to abandon their pure and holy faith so that they will adopt Christianity, end quote, in the words of a uh, American Jewish leader in 1967. In other words, most Jews are coming to the possibility of dialogue fearing that the only reason Christians want to talk is to convert them. Maybe these Christian overtures to conversation were only temporary admirations maybe prompted by Holocaust guilt, and would, Christians would soon turn to their historical conversionary efforts. In other words, Christians needed to demonstrate their sincerity over time. Secondly, Jew, we learned, I think, that Jews and Christians bring different agendas to the dialogue. Now, this is sort of not a deep, profound insight, but it's one we had to live to really understand. Jews and Christians come to the table with each other with different interests, concerns, historical knowledge, and conceptions and misconceptions about each other. Christians tend to want to talk religion, often asking, why don't Jews believe in Jesus? While Jews are more inclined to discuss social issues. Jews, understandably, as I've just said, tend to wonder if Christian invitations to dialogue are only a temporary cessation of conversionary campaigns of the past. While Christians, usually being unfamiliar with the history of Christian oppression of Jews, and maybe that's true of some folks in the room, I don't know, but such Christians can be shocked and guilt-ridden when they learn about that history for the first time. Like, how could this have happened? Christians may find it difficult to understand the depth of Jewish fears for the survival of the state of Israel, or fright over anti-Semitic incidents when they break out. While Jews tend to avoid expressing their general mystification over Christian claims that something called salvation is the result of the execution of a single Jew among thousands of Jews crucified under Roman imperial rule. Third thing I think we've learned in the dialogue, and I want to, um, I'll spend a little time on this and even more on the fourth point. We have learned, I think, that authentic dialogue requires that the other tradition be encountered on its own terms. We have to listen to the other's perspective. In Catholic circles, this was expressed in the quote, as you see, uh, in the 1974 document to implement Nostra Aetate, quote, Christians must therefore strive to acquire a better knowledge of the basic components of the religious traditions of Judaism. They must um, learn by what essential traits Jews define themselves in the light of their own religious experience. Now, this might seem pretty self-evident, if only to be courteous to somebody else, to, to hear their own frame of reference. But in my experience, I think it's very difficult for Christians to really hear Jews. And I think the reason for this is, crackpot theory of the day number one, is because of the presence of the Old Testament in the Christian Bible. We Christians think we are already familiar with Judaism because of these scriptures. Too many Christians are unaware that Judaism has evolved and developed a rich spiritual tradition after biblical times, just as Christianity has. Now, let me tell you a little true story that, that illustrates this point. Several years ago, a rabbi friend of mine, um, where I, uh, in a New England state where I used to live and work, received a phone call. And the phone on the other end, of the voice on the other end of the line said, oh, excuse me, rabbi, I've never called a synagogue before. Yes, how can I help you? Well, Pass uh, Passover I know is near, Rabbi, and I've been following the directions in the book of Exodus, 
and we've just killed a lamb in our garage, and I don't know what to do next. The rabbi said, laughing and not quite knowing what to say, was we haven't killed lambs for sacrifice in 2,000 years. And yet this Christian was reading the book of Exodus as if that was literally the practices of today. So this is, this is why hearing the other is so crucial. If we have misconceptions, we're not going to communicate. Number four, fourth lesson we've learned in the last decade. This I'm going to spend a little time on because it's been a very, um, I'd say in the 1990s and early 2000s, this was a particularly uh, uh, live issue in the Catholic community. By its very nature, interreligious dialogue requires the conscious renunciation of any desire uh, to convert the other. Let me give an example of how I think this is a, has been a difficult lesson for Christians and Catholics in particular in this case to learn. I want to give uh, as an example uh, a prayer that Pope Benedict the Sixteenth, um, in trying to extend an olive branch to certain Catholics that rejected the Second Vatican Council, he rewrote a prayer that is used among a small portion of Catholics on Good Friday. Uh, and the prayer said this, notice the title, Pro Conversione Judeorum, for the conversion of the Jews. Let us also pray for the Jews. May the Lord our God illuminate their hearts so that they may recognize Jesus Christ as Savior of all people. Let us pray, Almighty and everlasting God, you who want all people to be saved and to gain knowledge of the truth, Kindly allow that, as the fullness of peoples enter into your church, all of Israel may be saved through Christ our Lord. Now, this prayer at the time generated tons of criticism in the public media, as well as in dialogue between Catholics and Jews. Um, there was a statement issued by the Central Committee of German Catholics, for example, that said, the title was, no to mission to the Jews, yes to dialogue between Jews and Christians. Now, this is framed as a dichotomy. And I should add also that the prayer on Good Friday that is used by 99.9% .9 of Catholics around the world doesn't have any hint of conversion. It says we, we pray for the Jews, the first people to know God and that their life in the covenant may be deep and words to that effect. So this was a really different thing. Now, the framing of this controversy as a kind of binary choice between conversion or dialogue was cleverly illustrated in an Italian newspaper cartoon on the eve of Pope Benedict's visit to the Great Synagogue in Rome in January of 2010. As you can see, the cartoon shows the Pope crossing over the Tiber River on a tightrope, holding a balancing rod with the words conversion on the one hand and dialogue on the other. That's where things were uh, among certain Catholics at this point in history. Now, while the cartoon portrays a kind of papal indecision about which path to take in relating to Jews, Benedict later showed no uncertainty on the topic of Christian conversionary missions. In a 2011 book, he affirmatively quotes the Austrian abbess Hildegard of Brehm as follows, Quote, in the light of Romans 11.25, the church was not concerned herself with the conversion of the Jews, since she must wait for this for the time fixed by God until the full number of the Gentiles come in. Now, there's lots that could be said about this quote, too. But the point I want to make here is that um, at least before the end of time, the proper relationship between Jews and Catholics is to be in dialogue not in attempts to persuade one another. So in this and some other episodes, we see Christians being unsure of what the new relationship with Jews requires them to do. And in this case, um, it led to the understanding that any thought of trying to convert the other in the context of interreligious dialogue was just out of bounds. It would destroy and poison the dialogue. Now, I want to point out that this realization has been explicitly and vividly stated most recently by Pope Francis. 
And Pope Francis, as you may know, is very close friends for 20 odd years with an Argentinian rabbi named Abraham Skorka. And not too long ago, they uh, shot a, a brief video describing the meaningfulness of their many dialogues together over the years, long before anybody ever heard the name of Jorge Bergoglio uh, outside of Latin America. Um, so let me sh uh, share a short clip from this video because it says a lot and it's historic in its own way. <coughs> Well, it has some time in. Auschwitz in the 1980s. That was very divisive. 
canonization of a woman born Jewish who became Catholic named Edith Stein, Sister Benedicta of the Cross. It was controversial. There's a legacy of passion plays. Most vividly, recently uh, reprised in uh, Mel Gibson's film The Passion of the Christ in the early 2000s. It was highly controversial. And there are exchanges constantly and heatedly over the seemingly interminable Israeli-Palestinian conflict. These are all issues that are going to be with us and have been with us for a while. My point is that the personal context that have been established, the new structures of institutional interaction that have been forged, have withstood these kinds of controversies. We haven't walked away from each other. And as a further indication of this, Jewish statements about the sincerity of Christian efforts toward reform have started to appear, uh, particularly in 2015, celebrating the anniversary, the 50th anniversary of Nostra Aetate. Let me just read you three quotes very quickly. One, in a move whose sincerity has been proven, the church has made a decisive turning point of theological significance. We Jews should welcome Christianity as the religion of our brothers and sisters living in synergy with Judaism, end quote. That's a very strong phrase. It's from the Jewish community of France. Recently, two Orthodox Jewish statements have been issued, and the Orthodox Jewish community has been the most reticent about engaging in dialogue with Christians. Uh, one document said, since many Christians have acknowledged the eternal covenant between God and Israel, the people of Israel, we Jews can acknowledge the ongoing constructive validity of Christianity as our partner in world redemption. That's an astonishing quote if you know the history. Um, and we can, have, we can do this without any fear that this will be exploited for missionary purposes. Neither of us can achieve God's mission in this world alone. Again, it's an astonishing statement. And even the, uh, the more traditional orthodox statement had this to say, quote, over time it's become clear that the transformations in the church's attitudes and teachings are not only sincere but increasingly profound, and that we are entering into an era of growing tolerance, mutual respect, and solidarity between members of our respective faiths. I cannot emphasize to you so strongly, or, or too strongly, that these kinds of statements, both some of the Catholic ones I've read and these Jewish statements, are virtually impossible before the Second World War. They are totally unthinkable and unimaginable. And I stress this because looking around in the room, there are people who, all, many people in this room are living in the aftermath of the Second Vatican Council and don't appreciate the alienation and the hostility that prevailed uh, before that point. Um, so those are the six lessons that I think we've learned from the dialogue. And what I'd like to do is wrap up with um, some thoughts about the future and, and where it seems like the next stage of our growth from toddlerhood may be growing. I want to suggest that a way of describing the new relationship from a Catholic point of view, I'm not presuming that Jews will necessarily embrace this formulation at all, but I think for Catholics it's clear that our, our theological developments lead us to say that Jews and Christians are co-covenanting, notice continuing action verb, companions. Covenant should be understood as a dynamic sharing in life. It, speaking in this way, as both of us covenanting with God, conveys both commonality and distinction. We we relate to God in different ways that resonate with one another, that complement one another, but nonetheless they are distinct. And uh, the, the communities of Israel and the Jewish people both walk with God in their distinctive ways, but their experiences of the same Holy One mean that we can share many of our um, insights into the nature of God. As companions on the journey to the age to come, to the kingdom of God, Jews and Christians can assist each other in living out our covenantal duties. And I think with this uh, sort of phrase to capture the relationship as it has developed, um, 
it raises some interesting questions. And I'll speed through these because each of these could be the subject of a semester long course. Uh, but let me highlight them for you because I think this is part of the agenda for the future. Number one, both Jews and Christians need a new grammar of dialogue. What I mean by grammar, what I mean by grammar of dialogue is not just that we have a new vocabulary, but that that we the very structure of our conversations needs to change. Here's a quote um, from that recent Vatican document that I mentioned earlier, and I won't read it because of time, but notice that the word fulfillment is very prominent. That the church is the fulfillment of the old uh, covenant or of the, the people of Israel in the Bible. Well, what do we really mean by fulfillment? Does fulfillment mean that Jews have no further role in the plans of God in history? Has everything been summed up by the church, and so anything that preceded the church is obsolete? It's not clear that the word fulfillment is free of the replacement theology that we are ourselves trying to replace. So, um, so this needs some work in the future. Another thing is the land and the state of Israel uh, is a theological challenge for us, both Jews and Christians, I want to stress. Let me uh, unpack this a little bit. When the state of Israel was founded in 1948, neither the Christian nor the Jewish communities were expecting this development to occur. Jews understood that a, a return to the biblical homeland would not happen until the end of days, until the eschaton, until the birth of God's kingdom. And Christians felt that all Jewish claims to the land and to covenant with God had already been lost anyway, so what's the point of talking about a return to the land? So this, this sort of, I don't mean this in a pejorative sense, but in a way, um, a fortuitous convergence of forces in history that enabled the state of Israel to come into being was surprising to all kinds of questions, such as, um, for, for, I'll just say it, for Jews, what does it mean that there's a state that is not clearly happening in the end of days? Does that mean that the hand of God was involved in the formation of the state of Israel? Or maybe the hand of God was not involved in the formation of the state of Israel? Either option is tricky. It's problematic. And for Christians, um, how does one explain the fact that a return of Jews to the biblical homeland and the foundation of an autonomous state, how does one explain that reality in the face of Christian claims that Jewish uh, relationship to God had, had ended and had ceased with the coming of Christ. In other words, there's a real world, in your face, political development that occurs that overthrows theological presuppositions in the Christian community. And we have not yet worked out this interesting propositions that have been put forward, but this remains an ongoing problem. Um, thirdly, we need to develop non-zero sum theology. By non-zero sum, I mean the opposite of zero sum, and zero sum thinking is um, binary thinking in binary categories. Yes, no, winners, losers, true, false, correct, wrong. That's how Christians and Jews have thought about each other for centuries. We, we're moving beyond that, but how do you switch those habits? How do you, how do you overcome these past binary ways of thinking? Um, let me skip this, and um, because I'd like to leave a, a bit of time for some questions and conversations, let me simply say that um, both Pope Francis and some Jewish texts have made theological statements that are non-zero sum, that affirm the spiritual vitality of both Judaism and Christianity, and that is also historically unprecedented. But we need to develop this further. We need to develop it more clearly. I'll have you talk about those quotes uh, afterwards. Let me conclude with where I think we are. I think we Jews and Catholics in particular, but other Christians as well, are about to explore the uncharted paths of mutuality. What do I mean by this? Um, in the Middle Ages, the zero sum non-mutual relationship 
was portrayed on dozens and dozens of medieval cathedrals with these two female images, synagogue and ecclesia, synagogue and church. As you can see here, church on your left, this is from the Cathedral of Notre Dame de Paris, is majestic. She is wearing a crown. She is holding a staff of authority and has a cross on the top. She holds the chalice of the Eucharist under um, her right arm. Uh, she is dressed elegantly. She is clearly in control and powerful. Synagoga, on the other hand, is hunched over. The tablets of the law are about to slip from her hand. Her staff is literally broken. Her crown is lying at her feet. And she is blindfolded, in this case, rather uniquely to Notre Dame, by a serpent winding around her head. If you look closely, you can see the fangs of the serpent's head on the top of synagogue's head, probably recalling the serpent in the Garden of Eden. But the point is, is that she is defeated. Church has triumphed over synagogue. Now, when we were thinking about Nostra Aetate, these images are clearly contradictory to current Catholic teaching that I've been summarizing for you. So at St. Joseph's University, we commissioned the, the creation of a new sculpture that would express current Catholic teaching and also overturn and reimagine the medieval synagogue and church motif. And so here you see, and this is what I mean by mutuality into the future, here you see church and synagogue as study partners. Uh, the Jewish Talmudic tradition um, of studying text has a practice called Havruta study, which is pairs of people studying text in order to bring out their full meaning. Here, Christianity and Judaism are portrayed as study partners. They are sharing each other's sacred texts. They are both of equal dignity. Both are crowned because they both are in covenant with God. There is no suggestion of dominance or submission of one to the other. Instead, they are friends, learning from one another. That, I suggest, is where, uh, where we are today. And I just want to point out that you see signs of this kind of mutual relationship where we learn from each other and inspire each other to new creative insights about God and, and the faith. Um, you see the friendship between Pope Francis and Rabbi Skorka that I mentioned. This, uh, this is a, a friendship that lasted 20 odd years between Michael Signer on the right, a rabbi at the University of Notre Dame, and Father Hans Peter Heinz in Germany, who did some groundbreaking work in Germany and Poland uh, to overcome the legacy of the Holocaust. Um, I can't resist putting a picture of myself and my colleague, uh, Dr. Adam Bregerman, who team teach regularly. We set aside study sessions for ourselves whenever we can part at the time. Um, but engage in, uh, we just completed a paper uh, together, our first one, that, that we both agree that neither of us individually could have written this paper. It is the result of our interaction that made what we think is a, is a worthwhile contribution possible. And I'll mention Mary Boys and Sarah Lee, who, were, uh, who are religious educators, one Jew, one Catholic. Sarah Lee is not the baker. Uh, she is a Jewish professor of education, uh, now retired. Uh, but they did groundbreaking work on something called interreligious learning, which is how Jews and Christians learn in the presence of each other. All of these are signs of mutuality. And since I'm a theologian, I want to give it a theological definition. Mutuality, in theological terms, is a deepening love for the distinctive way of walking with God of the Jewish or Christian other who is no longer an outsider, who is no longer othered, but who instead has become a friend. That's where I think the relationship um, is, is on the precipice of, it's on the verge of, particularly here in the United States. It's not the same everywhere in the world. Uh, but again, uh, to underscore something I've repeated multiple times, but I obviously think it's important, this has never happened in history. We are literally living in times that have never happened before in terms of Christian and Jews relating to one another. Therefore, I think we have a responsibility to take advantage of these opportunities that our ancestors could have never imagined in their wildest dreams and pursue this new relationship that we've been blessed with. Thanks very much for your attention.
have some time now uh, before the break. I know some students have to leave at 1.20. We have some time for some questions. And so uh, I want to uh, allow for Dr. Cunningham uh, to answer some of those questions. So uh, uh, I will uh, go ahead and moderate uh, questions and, and, and uh, turn the mic back over to Dr. Cunningham. Thoughts, comments, questions, observations? Who's going to break the ice? Please. Please. What has, uh, what are your thoughts on dealing with Islam in relation to these some of the comments, some of the, some of the things you're talking about? So, Islam, of course, is a closely related Abrahamic tradition, is the, the language that's usually employed. The relationship between Judaism and Christianity is different than the relationship of either of those two with Islam, despite their close relationship historically and scripturally in particular. So I think the, um, what needs to happen in the future is that dialogue be increased both bilaterally among each of the three traditions, Jews with Muslims, Muslims with Christians, Christians with Jews, but also trilaterally. But the, because the issues of how each tradition relates to one of the other two are different, it's the bilateral dialogue that really needs, in my opinion, needs to be pursued uh, very strongly. And it actually requires folks with expertise in each particular bilateral relationship to really push the, the conversation forward. Um, uh, my own interest in, in dialogue and theologies regarding Jews, I cannot just transfer to Islam. It's a very different kind of experience, but there are people who do that. Uh, and all of that needs to be intensified. Please. You made mention of uh, non-zero thumb, the non -thumb theologies. How yeah. are you going to pursue that to overcome those habitual issues, I guess? So let me give you, an, the best thing is to give you an example, which I kind of skimmed over um, just as I saw the clock passing, the time passing. So um, sometimes you'll hear it said, Jews believe that the Messiah has not yet come, and Christians believe the Messiah has come, and those are kind of two antithetical positions and they both can't be right. That's zero something. Um, I think if we uh, are creative in how we theologize, and if we know how these earlier theologies develop, we can formulate something that's different. So for example, Pope Francis said, I'm going to paraphrase him as an example, he said that um, Jews experience the vitality of the Word of God studied in the Torah, and that this opens up unfathomable riches for the Jewish tradition. Well, Christians believe that the Word of God, that activity of God that invites and reveals and calls people into relationship, took flesh in a first century Jew who was crucified and raised. But what's common about both of those things is that both communities are encountering the living word of God through different mediations. One through the written text of the Torah, one through the glorified presence of the one who was crucified. But it's the same God's word that is operating in both communities. And so we can speak to one another in ways that we can't speak to other religious traditions that same way. And the figure of Jesus, then, from the Christian side, becomes a figure of commonality rather than a figure of division. So that would be an example of a non-zero-sum Christological approach to the relationship. Please. Uh, so, sometimes I talk about love as appreciative delight. And I just thought that when you were talking about mutuality and love, it's a love thing. Uh, appreciate the light of Judaism. Uh, Father Matt was in my class Tuesday. A number of things he said about uh, Judaism, I really found it insightful and, and helpful uh, as well. So I think appreciating one another, appreciate the light in Judaism, Catholicism, and it's a way of looking at it. I appreciate that. Uh, yeah, I think that's absolutely right. And, and I think that's what uh, is wrapped into Cardinal Casper's phrase, the sacrament of every otherness, uh, mm -hmm. from a Catholic perspective, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, let me just say that. This also um, bears on the relationship between Pope Francis and Rabbi Skorka. Um, Rabbi Skorka had, was appointed university professor at St. Joseph's, and he's with us this year. So I've gotten, I'm getting to know 
him better and their relationship better. There is a genuine affection for each other that's been developed over 20 odd years. And when they have in their book that they publish together, when they, when they come to a point where there is a, a difference of thought, um, for example, on the topic of abortion, there is a difference of thought. Not a radical difference, but a difference. And they, because of their affection for each other, were not going to make their differences define how they relate to one another. Mm -hmm. Rather, they treasure the difference in order to understand the other better. And that's love, right? You, yeah. you, you don't absorb the other into yourself. You don't admire your own reflection in the other uh, as a real kind of interrelationship. It's the otherness, I know this sounds kind of silly when you put it this way and grammatically speaking, but it's the otherness of the other that is precious theologically. And that is what we have only learned in the past 50 years. When Rabbi Scork was here last year, he emails uh, Pope Francis Reagan every mm -hmm. other day or day, but the word is hermano brother. That's how they yeah, yeah, the, the, and, and they and, and Avi insists to me, not that I've pushed him on it, but he stresses strongly that that word brother is not just a polite yeah. uh, Hispanic uh, custom. And they mean it sincerely. I mean, that, that, that's how they feel about each other. Please. So you mentioned about a breakthrough in communication, really a breakdown in communication, but don't you think of the digital age the way it is today? You know, you can open a book in any religion around the world and you can track that book being opened by a certain amount of people. And with the diversity of the way that, te that societies have been going through in the last decade, just diversity in and of itself, does that not lead into a part of that breakdown of communication, the acceptance of diversity of sexual preference or gender discrimination, so, the internet in itself being you're, worldwide? You're asking a profound question that there are like dozens of interesting ways of going by answering it. So the one I'm going to propose or, or offer you right now is this. I think the fragmentation and the multiplication of, of, inter, how do I put this, of, of encounters with otherness, which the technology provides, right? we're encountering people in a freewheeling, uninhibited way sometimes that we ordinarily wouldn't have contact with. That to me is precisely a reason why the revolution in relations between Christians and Jews is so important. We have to learn to overcome the natural proclivity to associate with our own tribe, if I can put it that way. We have to understand how the other benefits us. And that happens in many arenas, but it happens particularly in a historical sense in this relationship between Christians and Jews. And, and I want to say further on that score, if I might, that the presence at Catholic universities, like uh, here at St. Leo, of centers for uh, the study of Catholic-Jewish relations in that relationship is a crucial contribution to that. The Catholic educational system in the United States is second to none in the world in pushing the kinds of questions that I've given you a sample of today. Uh, and it's because uh, I think partially, you know, the word Catholic itself means everybody welcome. You know, it, it's an all-embracing term uh, with a lowercase c. And, um, and I think Catholic universities are particularly oriented toward the encounter with the other. And for me as a theologian, that takes particular shape in this particular relationship. So again, just to sum up this uh, answer that could go on and on, uh, I would say that, um, that the needs of our day actually point more toward direct face-to-face -to -face personal encounter as much as possible. Thank you. Sure. Okay. The end is near. <laughs> Please join me in thank you, thank you, Dr. Cunningham. Thank you very much, all of you, for coming out. It's been a pleasure to have you today. Um, please don't hesitate to be a stranger. Uh, come by the center.